This is Deep Natter. Hey, how would you describe yourself? I mean, what are you interested in? And not in terms of taking pictures or painting or writing, but what subjects really light you up? That's what Sean and I are talking about in this episode. Plus, we dive a little deeper into the Enneagram and take a look at how we're wired and whether or not there's anything we can do about it. Here we go. Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> Sean, you sound fabulous. <laughs> oh, I'm so good. <laughs> what happened? Uh, I might have got a bit of COVID. Oh. Just a smidge. Brutal. Yeah, just a sous-sol of COVID. Yesterday, I called Sean up. I'm like, wow, you sound like you got a little bit of a cold. And there's this pause. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I got the COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I've been lucky, though. I mean, I think, like, obviously people get it worse or, uh, or certainly in the early stages. And now it seems to be milder in general. You just sound a bit congested, is all. The only symptoms I've got are just a, a, like a mild headache that comes and goes. And, and yeah. like, I just feel like a head cold, like really stuffy, nose blocked. Um, but that's it. I mean, apart from, like, being hot a couple of nights and, like, um, waking up because I'm just overheated and breathing through my mouth because my nose blocked that's pretty much it so fingers crossed um and they reckon this one does kind of a kind of a four day and it's sort of for most people four days are feeling a little bit low and then you you, you bounce back so fingers crossed it's a quick turnaround you're very lucky yeah i mean you're very lucky that it's that it's so mild i mean geez well i mean i don't know i don't know what it's what you got in terms of information over there but here i mean these variants that are out here now <laughs> our new variants that we have in the uk <laughs> are, are, are very mild i mean we don't we don't have a lot of hospitalizations versus cases like early on it's it's pretty um, and i've had friends who've had the same thing and they've reported exactly the same simon baxter who you know mm. um he and his partner had it uh, a few weeks back maybe a month back and exactly the same he said it's just like a it was just like a cold for him as well. So I think I think most people now are experiencing sort of fairly mild symptoms when they get this thing. Yeah. So so even even UK based COVID has better manners than the Americans. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> even our diseases are polite. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. don't want to intrude too much. <clears throat> no, no, we wouldn't want to bother. <laughs> Jim, would you mind if we gave you the sniffles for a few days? <laughs> Thanks <laughs> that's, awfully. <laughs> that's all we can manage. We don't want to be a pain. We just want to make ourselves known. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So what have you been, have you, have you been able to kind of focus or what do you, how have you been occupying the days? What have you been doing? Yeah, I've been, I, I, honestly, I feel mostly fine. I feel like I'd normally feel with, it's weird, isn't it? Because like, I mean, if I had a cold three years ago, I'd just be carrying on with life, you know? Right. It's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not be going out and doing other stuff. You know, maybe I'd be, you know, careful not to breathe on people just out of courtesy but i wouldn't be thinking i have to stay home and and not not that we do i mean the, the law in this country is that there is no isolation now you can do what you like but i still want to try and be responsible for vulnerable people so yeah sure stay sure home mostly um but yeah i mean it's just uh yeah i'm, I'm carrying on I've, I've been doing i've been doing some work um are there any travel restrictions covid wise if you've got covid you can't travel yeah for sure uh, but I don't know in general. I think I think it's different depending on countries you go to. But it's 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 probably like a test before you leave, a test when you arrive, kind of thing. Right. For most places, but it's not quarantines and stuff anymore. For most places, I think. I think that's true. We really want to travel again. I mean, we we were talking even just this morning about getting to Tokyo, and I, I've been watching this Tokyo Vice, oh. and it makes me okay. want to go even more. <laughs> Gosh, I'd love to do Japan. It's high on my list. I've, I've wanted to go for years, yeah. Just looks like, a, you know, there's very few places you can go to in the world that aren't like a little bit like somewhere else. But Japan in my head feels like it's its own thing, you know? That's more exactly what I said to Adrian this morning. It somehow oh, yeah. feels different. Like you can go to France and Italy and, and they're yeah. still basically... I mean, you know, language barriers aside, it's the customs and rituals are still basically the same, right? Yeah. But it yeah. seems like Japan is just, it's just another world culturally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's, uh, and it just seems to be, 
especially for street photographers, it just seems to have been like street photography mecca, doesn't it? Where mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they have that culture of snap photography there, don't they? Um, well, that's what, that's what they call it. It's like that Dido Moriyama shoot from the hip kind of grab right. life as it happens, leave it messy. Um, sort of seem to grow up there, that kind of very reactive style of photography. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to give it a go. I'd love to go through and just hang out for a week or something, you know, explore around like Kyoto and cities like that. Just look also like part of it just looks stuck out of time. It'd be amazing to go. And have yeah. A look, you, know? you know, you, you just said something about sort of shoot from the hip and, and, and grittier. And, and I mean, the assumption is maybe not as polished as other types of street photography. Does that appeal to you? Do you think you could slide into that role or would you, would you try and frame that environment with your aesthetic kind of sensibility? You could just call me a control freak outright. I mean, you could just say it. I mean, cause it's, <laughs> I'm trying to be kind. <laughs> don't beat around the bush. Do you think you could ever do snap photography being the control freak you are? And the answer, Jeffrey, is no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, there you go. I don't, I, I don't actually think so because I think, I think like I am so, and I'm, I don't feel bad about it. It's just, I think the, the way that I shoot, I am quite, careful with compositions and deliberate right everything's quite i've noticed this recently like almost all the photographs i shoot and post these days are portrait orientation for some reason it's funny isn't it what you do reactively but then look back at and go like oh i'm getting into a pattern and lots of dead straight lines like i'm I'm framing very straight and very carefully i'm going a bit wes anderson i think like interesting and is that yeah. conscious while you're shooting or is that unconscious that you that you're subconscious whatever and you see it after after the fact I think I just, I think I just got into enjoying the graphical nature of images, especially when it comes to architecture and light and shade. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's kind of fed through to everything else is I I still look for that. I look for the lines. Um, I try and create negative space out the shadows and just have kind of lines through a, um, an image, either, either straight or, or the, the ever popular diagonal shadow or whatever. Like it's, 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 uh, I, th- I feel like I, I look for symmetry a lot. There's a lot of that kind of, um, those graphical elements I like, because I feel like if you're going to just shoot, um, more reactive photography where you're not being as careful or rigid, maybe I should say with the composition, then you, then, then it's good to loosen up completely and just shoot. And then you're shooting for subjects and stories, which I don't really do. Right. Uh, I shoot for shapes and shadows. So it's, it's just something of, I mean, we all gravitate towards different stuff, don't we? I've noticed when you shoot out and about, it's texture. Like you're mm-hmm. looking and hunting for textures, which yeah. when I look at your artwork makes complete sense. We just gravitate towards the things that are interesting to us. You know, it, it's funny too, the, the art side of like, I, I don't really like square format in my photography or, or in any yeah. photography, really. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of square format photographs, but I'm finding that on the painting side, I am yeah. much preferring that square format. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I don't know whether it's, you know, kind of getting back to, you know, I think some of this new, new work is, I mean, if I can pat myself on the back and, and I don't mean that I am at this level, but I, what I'm trying to do is sort of infuse Cold War propaganda and Reed Miles design aesthetic from Blue Note. Um, mm. And it's almost like I'm treating some of, well, a lot of them actually as album covers. Yes. Because I, I really, I love that format. I love that album cover format. And I've been so influenced and and inspired by that genre and specifically the work of reed miles um who who famously for those of you who don't know reed miles designed most of the iconic records uh record sleeves for the blue note label um Mm. phenomenal work and and just incredible you know typography and colors and design and layout and all of that and i find that that square aesthetic fits my paintings more naturally, I guess, than in my photography, even though I can crop down or you can, you know, most modern cameras now you can shoot square right from within the camera. I still prefer a more elongated or, or let's throw it out, Sean, cinematic (laughs) aspect ratio. (laughs) Some people just swooned. When they... That's right. That's right. <laughs> have you seen, speaking of kind of line and, and form, have you seen a film called Visual Acoustics? 
No. Uh, there was an architectural photographer in, uh, gosh, I think he started shooting in the 40s uh, by the name of Julius Schulman and mm. photographed most of these sort of iconic mid-century architecture in and around Los Angeles. Uh, and there's a documentary narrated, I think it was narrated by Dustin Hoffman, if memory serves. Anyway, it's called Visual Acoustics, and it's all about him and his photography. And it's just, it's a fantastic watch if you are oh, really cool. interested in that kind of photography. Do you think there's anything about the fact that you love your, your artwork square and the al album cover aesthetic? and your photography not. Do you, do you think there's like a conscious effort on your part to separate the two and give them their own breathing space or voice? Man, that's an interesting question. I've, I've, I don't know that I've ever consciously thought about it, but it, I think it makes sense, right? It, it, yeah. Because I, well, I think also I'm, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe I'm trying to sort of um, cultivate, establish, build, different bodies of work that that aren't on the surface related yeah and i'm trying to figure out honestly i'm trying to figure out what i'm better at you know i i, I think i'm a mediocre photographer at best i think i think my best photography is when i apply very sort of graphic yeah. rules standards and composition to the image yeah i I'm, i think i'm a, a a really terrible sort of street photographer and i don't really Understand it interest you there, doesn't no, it? No, not really. And I don't really understand portraiture. Yeah. Because I'm 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 focusing on something other than the person's face. You know, yeah. I'm focusing on environment or I'm focusing on the lines that are being created or the shapes that are being created in the background or whatever. Um, so I don't think I'm very good at that. But I really do love architectural photography. I really do love getting up close and and just trying to photograph texture and detail. And I think you're right. I think there is a connection there to the paintings. Although, I mean, I, I, I don't think about it while I'm doing it. Yeah. It just sort of shows up afterwards. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I think I do, I mean, not to that extent, but I do that similarly in that now I shoot all my portraits four by five hmm. and all my out and about stuff three by two. And I like that. I'm giving myself different aspect ratios to work with in different genres so that I can play with everything a little bit. Yeah. Um, that is a conscious choice. There also, I, I do think four by five is a really classy portrait aspect ratio. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But yeah, it's nice to kind of have both and also stay sharp at both, you know, be able to shoot either and compose either. Cause I think, I think all cameras that come out nowadays, the vast majority of digital cameras are three by two out of the box. So, you know, you, you we're really used to seeing in that aspect ratio, but forcing ourselves to try a different aspect ratio and trying to compose well is is a good skill to have. Um, like I started doing portraits with, I got that old uh, Yashica TLR, mm -hmm. which is square, obviously. It's a six yep. by six medium yep. format. And that was an interesting thing to do, to shoot a portrait uh, that is square. Because how do I, if I'm shooting an environmental portrait, where do I put the background interest? Where, where do I put them in the frame? It was an interesting challenge. I think it's, right. it's a good thing to do to kind of play around with all those different aspect ratios and because each one has something to teach you compositionally, I reckon. If you're shooting portraits square, because you, you also want to include that environment, is there, a, is there a concern that the subject, and I've got my air quotes, is is too small, like the actual subject is too small relative to the environment because you're trying to show where that person is in the world? Or, or do you feel a limitation in that way? I think my, my problem is I want to get close to the subject Yeah. anyway. So I fill the frame with their face a lot. And that means there isn't space right. for, for, for the context. So if I'm shooting three by two environmental portrait, I can fill the frame top to bottom with their face and still have left and right that shows the context. But if I fill the frame with their face on square, I'm done. Yeah, there isn't right, any room right. for anything else. So it's right. like a different, it's kind of a different challenge. Or I could stick them slightly over to the left-hand side of a three by two, still fill them top to bottom, but like have something on the right-hand side that's a bit of context. You know, you can play with things like that, but you can't really do that on square. So it's like an interesting challenge. I guess, I mean, you could just back up um, and, you know, have the face smaller in the frame and more of the context. That's That's obviously a solution. But then you've got choices to make about... How are you going to arrange these elements in a square 
and and how you're still going to make it an environmental portrait and not just a photograph of a space and there happens to be a person in it, you know? Right, right. That And that's kind of what I was saying is that it, there's a weird tension that gets created that you have to balance, I would think, much more deftly with a square format environmental portrait because you've got to balance that that background foreground element more carefully. Yeah. It's funny. I, I, I just looked up Reed Miles while you were talking and I just I found a um an album cover. It's it's a new perspective. Donald Bird, Donald Bird band and voices, and it's uh it's a black and white square shot. It's a photograph of uh the front of a car. I'm not sure what the car is, but it's got like a beautiful sort of sweeping light on the bottom left. It fills most of the frame. Then the windscreen sort of in the middle, and then he's off at the back on the right, which I actually think is such a brilliant. It's, so, it's funny we're talking about environmental portraits of square format. That's a great example. Um, oh yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it looks like yeah. uh like an old Jaguar, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or like a yeah, Jag E type or something. Yeah. That's a but cool shot. A way to do an environmental portrait square. Yeah. yeah. He was such a genius. I mean, I, I encourage anyone who is a fan of of just great composition, go look up Reed Miles' work. It's it's so terrific. It looks like old um Bond intros. Does he have anything to do with that world? Uh no. That was a guy called Maurice Binder. Uh, right. who did most of the Bond intros. Um, it's got a similar aesthetic. Very it? That, similar that kind aesthetic. of era, that vibe, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I love them both. It's really cool. Absolutely. But it's so clean. Everything he does is so clean. Mm-hmm. And look at this Don Wilkerson shouting one with the, with the like, as if it's gone through a shredder, photograph's gone through a shredder, and it's just mm-hmm. strips. Mm-hmm. Super cool. Super cool. And I think, uh, I mean, the the rumor, and I've read this in a couple pieces the rumor was that he was paid fifty dollars for each of these compositions oh, oh kill me <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> the cool thing is as well is he obviously created a color palette for himself this kind of orange mm-hmm. and black that mm-hmm. he ran through all his work regardless of the client it was obviously at a time when it was you go to that artist you get his color palette his thing his way which is really cool right yeah it's really cool yeah i can see i can see like I can see his influence on your work. It's interesting. It's really mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, compositionally. I mean, I I'm not yeah. quite there with with his, and I'll say it, his brilliant use of typography. He is. Yes. Yeah, you know, I yeah, I, I know that he's mostly known as a designer, but God, his typography is so so spot on. That's a lot of it. I think this whole thing would fall down without that amazing typography. It's really mm-hmm. cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really cool. Can we put a link to him in the? In yeah, the sure. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. Uh, I'll put a link to the the book that I have, it's um, you know, it's in the one of the piles behind me because I still don't have a bookcase <laughs> here. But it's it's a it's a really great book, and the book itself is square format, so you know these oh, cool. these things That's appear great. kind of in their natural you know state. Yeah. I guess. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I you know I asked you a question earlier mm. and i i'm still having a tough time answering it and i it's it all it came about on this walk that we do these morning walks adrian and i when we mm. go out and walk cooper and i've been thinking about writing more and and the whole newsletter thing and now that i don't have a, a blog i don't even have the ability to blog because i've changed platforms and i'm no longer on on wordpress or anything so i've got to start mm-hmm. thinking about these things in, in kind of a new perspective or new parameters. And I think it's going to be my, my blog will end up being the newsletter, but I was thinking about, and I asked Adrian and I've asked you, I asked a couple friends, you know, when you, when you look at me from the outside, because I, I have a hard time focusing on just a few things. Mm-hmm. I'm always kind of in, in multiple directions. And I asked this question of what are the three things that I am most interested in? What are the three things that I keep coming back to in your opinion? Yeah. Because I have a hard time with that. And I think this is an interesting question to ask of ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe of, of each other. Adrian said, uh, design and aesthetics, mm-hmm. pop culture, and Cold War kind of history. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because it, the, the first r- response from a couple of friends was, you know, and I think this was one of your responses too, was like conversations, painting, and I forget what the third one was, but those are I actions. I, said, I think I said audio, 
interviews right right and and painting yeah because that audio for me is a separate subject for you that kind of rolls in a love of old radio uh, yes. a love of music those kind of things so, so yeah. well produced uh, affecting audio for whatever reason the art of the interview is something you're really interested in mm-hmm. for you for yourself or from others and yeah the 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 world of painting because it's kind of what you do so that, that was my answer yeah and i see i see those as vehicles for the interests those aren't the interests themselves those are those are sort of the distribution channels so what is it so that you're i'm talking about subject matter more yeah like, subject matter what what is it that we are interested in and if we look at that, does that give us a different understanding of, of the work that we make? Or, or does it clarify where we need to be going relative to where we are currently going? I don't know. I mean, these are things that I think about a lot. Yeah. And, I, and I start writing things down about it. Um, and you said that you would have a hard time answering that about yourself. Yeah, I would. Yeah. To, to, to pare it down to three things. The, I guess the way you'd say it is like, what three things always come up in conversation with Sean? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's a much better way of, of asking that question. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm not sure. It's interesting. It, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really, it's a, because again, like if you're not talking about uh, things you do, like photography, for example, for me, but you're talking about subjects, like what I point that photography at, mm-hmm. um, that's a hard one. Like I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, should I try and answer for you? Yes, please. Um, I guess a- any clarity guess, that anyone can, <laughs> can offer about this yeah, is, well, maybe, yeah, is maybe much appreciated. If people want to chime in with the three things, like I'm going to guess, like I'm still going to stick to audio because yeah. I feel like you are obsessed with with the mechanics of good audio mm. and how it's been used and the romance of old radio. And you do have a love of music um, that sort of goes quite deep. You know a, a lot, you know, and you, and you want to know more. Uh, so th- th- I think that's often something that comes up in conversations with you. Did you hear this band? We went and heard this band on the weekend. They were amazing. Um, the, the radio show you did online for a while was great. People really seemed to enjoy that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, like I suppose under that would come things like Studs Terkel and you know, people who've used audio and radio theater to kind of put stuff out there. So I'd still, I, th- I think that comes up quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm a hundred percent with Adrian thinking about it is like design and aesthetic, but design as broader than just visual, like how something works, you're yeah. really interested in, like fascinated yeah. by, you want to take stuff apart and you want to see uh, what went into making it. And you want to talk to people and ask them why, they chose that way of making it or why they, what need they felt it was fulfilling. And yes, aesthetics goes into that as well. Like you're very interested in uh, good aesthetics and how they communicate. So yeah, I would say audio, audio and design, but like though that broad, it's going to be that broad for you. Cause I think it is both of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess on the spot, like I'd say, I think you're fascinated by people. Which is, which again, like, so, so I said interviewer first, but maybe that is, that comes from your fascination with people. I think you're very interested in how people think, uh, what drives them, uh, which also makes you interested in things like politics Mm -hmm. and how people kind of, uh, you know, react or act in their own self-interest or not. Or, or 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 vote or get hyped up about things. You're very interested in that, but then you're also interested in creative people and why they do what they do in their process, which is also tied up in in how they think. So, I guess broadly, if you want a title for that one, it would be psychology. Yeah, I think you're very interested in people's psychology, why why they See, act I, or say the things that they say. I would say the same thing about you, but I would almost move that from the from the how they think to how they feel category. Oh, interesting. Well, you'd be very generous there. That's, that's very interesting. Huh. Because you, you, you are so fascinated by, by the behavior that people exhibit and how they get there. And, and our, and our, I think this is one of the things that I admire a great deal about you is you are able to articulate those thoughts about feelings 
in a way that's approachable and isn't off-putting at all. And I, I have a very hard time with that. You're able to almost distill concepts that are, that are otherwise really maybe esoteric or obtuse into something that is recognizable and relatable. And I think because of that, I mean, among other things, you're going to make an absolutely fantastic counselor or therapist because you are able to, to pull out what we can't see mm. about ourselves and, and sort of parrot that back in a way that is relatable without being threatening or combative or hostile or judgmental. And, and that's such an amazing skill that you, that you display every day that I've, that I've known you. Oh, that's really kind of you. Thank you. You know, I, I've got an honest insecurity about that because I've been told by some people in my life who are close to me that I'm too cold and rational. I don't have that experience with you at all. Not once. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, interestingly, a lot of these people were people who I, I think were being self-indulgent. I was calling them on it. So there was a, there was a motive behind it, but I, I always feel like, like a lot of what, and I don't know where this goes because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried, honestly, because I, I, I think the way that I think and talk about this stuff is not necessarily very politically correct because I don't believe we should acknowledge and validate everyone's feelings. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's good or healthy. And that seems to be like the prevailing view at the moment. If someone is having, you know, a, a, a depressive day or an anxious day, you just have to let them feel it and give them a hug. And I'm, I'm like, no, you have to get them to interrogate it and ask what, what that feeling's there for, because that way you might find out what it's really about and you get to solve something. Maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you've got genuine chemical anxiety issues, but maybe you, maybe you can work out what that's about because feelings aren't facts. And I think that kind of more rational approach to feelings makes a lot of people quite angry because they feel I'm invalidating what they're feeling. So the fact that you say that, like is, is quite encouraging. <laughs> I think you'd have a cute. Well, it's not, I mean, <laughs> it's not what we're used to, you know? I mean, you and I've talked about this offline and online that, that you, you are, you are an incredible friend, but you are not going to suffer fools and just let things go. I mean, we talked about this last week, you know, you, you are, you are very much, you know, you want somebody's good. You, you, you want their good. You want them to be healthy and good and happy and all that. But you're also going to call out when they're not being honest about either what they're doing or how they're feeling. And that's, that's a rare quality to have. A, but rarer still is the way you are able to communicate that where it doesn't sound um, judgmental or, or dismissive or um, like you're somehow better than. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and, and I love that that's your take on it because that, that's what I want to be. I, I, because for my mind, like, I'm actually not your friend if I validate every feeling you have. Right. And tell you to stay in bed every day because shame, it's rough. Like, I'm not really being your friend. I'm being your friend if I tell you the truth about what I really see, which we all think about each other. We all think, like, you're starting to get too self-indulgent with that feeling and you're, you're hamstringing your own journey. At that point, you have a choice. Either tell them that and risk that they don't like you anymore or get defensive, which, by the way, often happens. And I've lost friends because I've risked saying the thing that I actually see. Right. But that's me being a friend. And if you choose to kick me out because you'd rather protect yourself and not listen to what I'm saying or not even consider that, that I might have seen something that you have a blind spot about, that's okay. Then I wish you well on your way. But I did the right thing. Like I thought something and I had the guts to say it to you yeah. because I cared. And I, and I, I hope that I always communicate in a way that like I care. I hope that always comes across. Yeah, I, it, but, it has yeah. with me. I can't speak for everybody else in your life, obviously, but for me... Yeah. You will, there, there have been several times where you go, Hey, I'm going to stop you there. And, and I, I don't mean to be unkind, but I'm going to call bullshit on this. And here's why. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, a friend of mine said, you can tell anybody, you can pretty much tell anybody anything if you serve it up the right way. Yes. And I think there is such a measured 
response that you are always conscious of. You are always conscious of how how your feedback, how your response, how your even even questioning is going to come across. That it's never from a space of anything but wanting that person's good or that person's health or that person's well being or whatever it is. Um, I don't get that anyway. And and if and if other people do, maybe. You know, maybe it's something that I'm not seeing or, or I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But we've had some very difficult conversations for me. You have made some very difficult observations about me. And while my first response might be to say, well, you know what? Piss off. I don't need to listen to this. I know enough about you to know where you're coming from. And that has to be. That has to be from, from the point from which I start of he wouldn't say this if it if it if there wasn't something there. This is this is not a person who just needs to be right, needs to be heard, needs to have an opinion, needs to have a judgment. This is not who this person is. So I have to I have to look at that first and go, OK, I know where this is coming from. So I'm at least going to hear this out. And th- those are the friends that I love. You yeah. know? I mean, I've, I, I can I can I know who those friends are. Yeah. So if I have a conversation with them and they think I have a blind spot, they will tell me, "Hey, man, you 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 you're lying to yourself." Let's let's. And I've got friends who are more brutal about it than I am, but I think I think I understand that that motive. So I, it's never a question, and I and I've given them permission over the years. Like you just you tell me if you think I'm like if you think I'm off the map somewhere or I'm I'm not being totally honest about what's really going on. I, I, if you don't tell me you're a bad friend, so it's not like I can't take it. I expect it of my friends. I don't really have a lot of friends who aren't willing to do that. Um, but it's, yeah, I, 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 I think it's a, I think it's a good way of being, honestly, still be, yeah. you still have a responsibility to be kind. Absolutely. But you also have a responsibility to be brave and mm-hmm. say the thing risking that your friend won't like you anymore, or they're not ready to deal with that thing you just spoke about. And so they choose to push you out of their life because they want to avoid this thing. And unfortunately now you're attached to this thing. Like that's very painful. Like, don't get me wrong. And I've had it happen a lot of times. That's very painful, but you, you, you have to choose, I guess. Like what, at at that point, if you can tell that, look, this is really holding them back. This, whatever thing it is. Yeah. You've got to find a way to say it. And you're right. It's difficult. I mean, I, I had to do that. Um, it's been over a year now. One of my oldest friends, um, who I just, it broke my heart to see how this person could not see that there was more to this life than what he was allowing himself, Yeah, that he was settling for a, a life that was, that was less than happy and, and had done it for years. And he couldn't see that yeah. my suggestions were coming from a space of, look, I, I love you and I want your good. I want you to be happy. You deserve to be happy. Yeah, but it just it couldn't happen, and I had I had to walk away from it because I I didn't like I didn't like who I who I ended those conversations feeling like mm-hmm. I didn't like that, and yeah, you know, it's like you you go ahead and be you, and and that's fine, but I'm trying to do too much work on me to end a conversation feeling like I'm back at square one. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I'm with you 100. percent and it was for, hard. For the sake of yeah, yeah, it is. It's very difficult because even though you know you're doing the right thing, it still costs you. In fact, it it often costs you, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Whether whether straight away and then it comes back later, or you can lose things completely because you try and tell the truth. And and for the sake of vulnerability, like I I have to say I've done it wrong a lot of times in my life. I haven't sounded caring, especially when it was connected to me, and I've hmm. been hurt by something. I've definitely done it wrong, and I've had a lot of things to learn. About, um, I mean, my family has a history of uh, some mental illness with some of the members of my family, and um, I, I in my twenties was very hard on that stuff, like hmm. because they were destroying their lives and other people's lives around them, and it was given too much space to be destructive in my mind. And wow. so, I, I, I said things, but I didn't say them kindly. I mean, my mom still to this day, when she heard I was going to this counseling course, my mom said to me because she used to say years ago, "Whatever you do, never become a counselor." Really? <laughs> yes, yeah, she literally said that. Because, uh, because of how you responded yeah. to the family? Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, and this was back when I was, you know, years ago. I studied what twenty years ago plus. I studied psychology in university, and and she was like, just never become a counselor because you wouldn't be any good at it. <laughs> and I think it was that empathy thing. But now, when she heard I was doing it, now she was like, oh yeah, no, it's probably fine now. And by the way, can I have some sessions? I'm like, nope. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it's going to be right, a definite right. conflict of interest. <laughs> tell tell me yeah. about that moment of empathy, that moment of grace. That was there a moment of empathy or a moment of grace where where you were able to kind of turn that kaleidoscope and see things differently and and not react in the same way, whether that's to your family or to friends or to strangers. What Was there a specific moment or was it an evolution? There's been a bunch. There's yeah. been a lot of different moments. Um, without mentioning people, yeah. uh, I, guess, I guess that I've had some long-term relationships in my life uh, that were very significant relationships with me, with people who were mentally ill. Mm -hmm. and I, I tracked when I started to get honest with how I dealt with this stuff and, and the fact that I think I was scared of mental illness. And I think this is true for a lot of people. If you live with somebody, uh, in your family, say who has mental illness, yeah, it's scary because it's unpredictable. So every day mm -hmm. you wake up, mm -hmm. you don't know what everyone's day is going to be like because of that one person it's scary. And I think I was, I was scared of it in a way that made me very uncomfortable in the space I was living in. So I think over the years, I, I started to track, especially with relationships later on, how I was talking to people around issues of mental illness, where it was like out of fear and protecting myself because I felt very uncomfortable and where it started to be. The, the, the rule I made for myself is I should be able to have every conversation I have with this person play back in public and be able to stand by every word. Mm. That, wow. That, that, that has to be the way that I talk to people. Otherwise, I have an integrity issue. And if it's getting to the point where I'm like, well, no, you know what? Like, they deserve this. It's a really bad situation and no one's allowed to hear private conversations. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to them badly. Then it's time to leave. Hmm. If, 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 you, if you're saying I cannot hold on to my integrity and treat people with kindness, then it's time to leave. When did this become true for you? How, how, what are we talking about? How old were you when this became kind of the realization that that's, that's how you have to treat people and that's how you have to speak to people? Probably 30s. Really? I would oh. say like sort of early, mid-30s, I started to have this realization and then it was just a process, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, in my 20s, I was a little zealot anyway. I mean, the, the, <laughs> right. you know, the, I mean, the, the church got the, There are got stories, the people. Me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, was a, I was an iconoclast. I wanted to bring everything down I didn't believe in, you know, right. that, was, that I could tell was a facade. I wanted to break it all down. So I think that was true across the board, not just with church. But then, yeah, I mean, hopefully at some point in your middle years, you start to soften and realize that actually you can still fight causes you believe in, but you can also do it with compassion. Mm. And you can do it taking care of people. And then if it if you can't make the changes that you want to make, either in groups or individuals or society in general, if, if the only way to do it is to be violent or destructive with people, either with your words or whatever, then it's time to walk away. It's time to leave. You know, it's it's not it's not a good person to be. Mm -hmm. you know, never it never went that far for me, obviously. But like there were things I said at least that that like not a lot, but it's, it's one is too much, but just things I say, which is like, I wish I hadn't said that. I was really angry. I was really hurt. And I could say that I was justified in being hurt, but the choice I make after I'm justified in being hurt is still mine to make. Who do I want to be? You know? Yeah. I love that. You know, and, and you are constantly willing and able, frankly, to look at yourself with such a such an objective, or at least this, this is my experience. You, you, you may and, and probably see this differently, but you are able to see yourself so objectively in terms of how other people see you, not just how you see yourself. And you're constantly sort of refining that and, and honing um, the way you are in the world. Um, it's, it's, it's really inspiring to see. You know what it was for that for me? I think it was like reading biographies. There was a stage mm. in my 30s where I just started to devour biographies. And, and it, it really impressed on me reading all those books that you have one life to try and make yourself into the best version of yourself you can be. That's it. You've got X amount of years and you don't know what that is to try and make yourself into the best human being you can be. And I just took that on as a challenge reading all those biographies after I left the church thinking, I'm really going to work on this. I'm really going to try and be somebody 
that I can stand by and be proud of at the end of it. And it's going to be a process. I'm going to make lots of mistakes. But as long as you just take a little step every day and just polish something else every day and take out a bit of the trash every day, you know, over the years, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good person. You know, I, I just keep wanting just a little bit a day, just mm. keep moving. And I, I think I've always had that as a goal since leaving the church, especially. Um, and, it, and I think it's because I needed to replace what the church was because the church also pushes you to be the best version of yourself. It's just they have a very specific idea of what that is. Right. And it's not anything that I relate to. So when I left the church, it was like I've been working so hard to be, I don't know, quote unquote, holy or something, you know, like like some floating saint. And it's Hold on, all... hold on for a second. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, that's that's what I wanted. I wanted to be seen as somebody who was kind of beyond reproach, kind of thing. But then, but then the the methodology of that didn't make sense anymore. You know, right. I didn't want to be someone who, because I read the Bible every day, I was I was a good person because that's bollocks. Um, so I, I, I had to replace it with something so I could keep moving and keep developing myself. And that's when I started reading more psychology philosophy and biography stuff so i could work out how have other people done this on their own steam how have they decided to to turn themselves into better people and everyone's got a different journey there's a there's a great book by robert green called mastery Mm -hmm. i've heard of it i haven't read it it's really good it just goes through a bunch of people who are masters in their field about their very different journeys to becoming really good at what they did and hopefully good people as well um and it just impressed upon me like you have to find your own way but it's about asking yourself the tough questions, staying as self-aware and as brutally honest with yourself as you can be. And I'm my hardest critic anyway, so that was an easy part to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, just tweak a bit every day. Is there someone whose biography that you have read that you can think of or point to that felt particularly inspirational in that way? Is, was there, is there someone who is an example uh, above someone else? Or uh, Above is a really weird way of phrasing that, but... Is there someone that stands out for you? I mean, there's loads. Um, I mean, one I've read more recently would be uh, The Book of Joy, which is um, captured conversations between the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Mm. And that I find fascinating because both of them came out of incredibly repressive regimes. You know, the Dalai Lama fleeing um, Chinese occupation of Tibet and Desmond Tutu having to struggle against apartheid in South Africa and how they're both the most gracious, sweet, lovely men who have, who, well, sadly Desmond's passed away now, but who, who have so much to give the rest of us and who didn't let difficult things turn them into, into worse human beings. They, it let, they let them forge them uh, into better human beings. I mean, <laughs> they were, have I said it here? I can't remember, but like we, there was a, I heard a, whenever they go to religious conferences together, they can't get the meeting started because they're sitting in a corner having a tickle fight. You know, they're just like, <laughs> they're just like irrepressible children. Right. They've, they've, they've like transcended all the politics and the weirdness and they just, they just love each other to bits, you know, and they, they have a lot to tell the rest of us about what really important things are and, and their journey to get there. Cause that wasn't a foregone conclusion. I, mean, I think it could have absolutely, they could have absolutely become, bitter people because of the horrible experiences both of them went through i mean right. a lot of us would have become bitter people but they didn't so why and and how can i turn my my bitter chapters into into things that refine me like that like that's that's what it's about surely yeah how much of that do you feel is innate in in terms of how how we respond or who we become how much of that can we learn versus mm. it's it's almost imprinted on us from birth i don't know the answer i i know for me that i do i do have a little bit of a head start on this just because my personality type this is kind of a natural bent for my personality type it's a priority mm-hmm. because of the way that i'm wired and i i don't know whether that's nature or nurture or what but that's the way i am so like i'm type 1 on the enneagram 
Um, and I mean, type one on the Enneagram, I've got a description in front of me, it just says ones are conscientious and ethical with a strong sense of right or wrong. They're crusaders, teachers, advocates for change, always striving to improve things, but afraid of making a mistake. Well organized, orderly and fastidious. They try to maintain high standards, but can slip into being critical and perfectionistic. They typically have problems with resentment and impatience at their best. They can be wise, discerning, realistic and noble. They can be morally heroic. So that's that's like my personality type. So the fact that like that's the the task I've given myself in my life kind of makes sense with who I am, mm-hmm. you know. But I think I think yeah, each the thing about how you're wired is each of you have your own your own aspirations, your own path, your own things that you think are important, your own fears and desires. Right. And it's, it's finding a path forward to try and make yourself the best human being you can be with your personality type. Um, I think you're a four, aren't you? I'm a four wing five. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I read yours? Please. Yeah. So fours are self-aware, sensitive and reserved. They're emotionally honest, creative and personal, but can also be moody and self-conscious. Withholding themselves from others due to feeling vulnerable and defective, they can also feel disdainful and exempt from ordinary ways of living. They typically have problems with melancholy, self-indulgence and self-pity, but at their best, they can be inspired and highly creative. They are able to renew themselves and transform their experiences. So what it's you going, okay, well, if that's how I'm wired, like what's forward for me with that, you know? And and I I will be completely honest. I've never applied that. I, I mean, I've looked at it. I've done you know I've done it a couple of times just to make sure it was right. <laughs> it mm. always, it yeah. always comes yeah, out yeah. the same way. Yeah. Um, but I've never gone okay. If 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 these are my sort of predispositions, if if this is the way I'm wired, what paths can I outline for myself that play to those strengths and benefits rather than fighting against them? Yep. I've never done that. And maybe it's time to do that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these personality descriptions will have things for you. So personal growth recommendations for four, I'll just, I'll just skim through the first line of each it says, do not pay so much attention to your feelings. They're not a true source of support for you, as you probably already know, right? <laughs> avoid, avoid putting off things until you're in the right mood. Commit yourself to productive, meaningful work. Self-esteem and self-confidence will develop only from having positive experiences, whether or not you believe that you're ready to have them. Hmm. A wholesome self-discipline takes many forms from sleeping regular hours to working regularly to exercising, blah, blah, blah. And then avoid lengthy conversations in your imagination, particularly if they're negative, resentful, or even excessively romantic. Like those are some very practical things to look out for to work on yourself. I do all of those last things. Of course. (laughs) Pretty regularly. I mean, mean, mine, mine is like... Mine are very obvious as well. Mine are like, learn to relax, take some time for yourself. You have a lot to teach others and are probably a good teacher, but do not expect others to change immediately. I mean, Mm. these are all things I do. It's easy for you to work yourself up into a lather about the wrongdoing of others. Absolutely. It's important for you to get in touch with your feelings, particularly your unconscious impulses. And that's that kind of rational, emotional balance. Mm -hmm. And your Achilles heel is your self-righteous anger. And that is 100% me. You, you get angry easily and are offended by what seems to you to be the perverse refusal of others to do the right thing <laughs> as you've defined it. Like all those things, I have to watch out for those because I know those will take me down a bad path. Yeah. But the fact that you are, you are aware and, and you, you continually remind yourself of that so that those things remain true. Mm. They remain true for you in theory and in practice. And I think that's, if if I'm being honest, that's one of the many areas where I I haven't developed good habits. I haven't developed good habits around reinforcing how I appear to be wired from you know m- multiple yeah. years of multiple tests of this kind of uh, of, 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 of these kinds. Um, it's and I think you're allergic to structure, <laughs> right? Right. But on the other it's side of it, for you, we're it allergic is. to it, but we need it. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's that's actually growth for you is doing the thing that you don't want to do. And it's so true for every personality type. The thing that you don't want to do is the balance your personality type needs. Yeah. And as much as I hate structure, if I structure out my week and use, you know, Apple reminders and and all mm-hmm. and have things written out where all I have to do is walk in and go, okay, today I'm supposed to do this, this and this. Mm-hmm. I promise you at the end of the week, I am happier. I promise yeah. you that. Absolutely. But I don't do yeah. it. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, none of us do. Like we we all slip into the 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 path of least resistance often, and we we're unhappy and we forget why. But we we really know the answer. A lot of us, by the way, anyone who wants to do that uh, enneagram, it's e double n e a g r a m, and you can find a free enneagram test online. I'm sure, and you can go find out what type mm-hmm. you want. Read the descriptions. It's really interesting. It's like any personality test. It's nothing magical and obviously no one fits a label and or you're still a special flower but it, it will help you it will help you realize kind of some of the things you're wired at because yeah. you know, there are there are traits between human beings and we can learn from each other it's really helpful i found it to be eerily accurate <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah and i'll be honest with you the first i think the first time i did it with you um you had suggested it and i was like eh, i've done those before but I've done it a few times since, and it always comes out the same way. Yeah. There are different questions and different answers, but the end result is always the same. And I read, you know, multiple descriptions of a four wing five and I go, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. I mean, I I find that I find any tool, you know, anything that gives you a little bit more self-awareness and helps you get a better picture of who you are, why you're driven the way you are and what you can tweak is immeasurably helpful. Subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything in your favorite podcast app and support the show by leaving a review or a rating wherever you listen or by sharing the episode on social media. Help support the cost of producing the show directly by tapping the donate button at jeffreysidoris.com that's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S dot com. Connect with Sean on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Tuck. That's S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K. On his website at SeanTucker.photography or by searching for Sean Tucker on YouTube. Connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Jeffrey Sidoris. As always, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. We really appreciate it and we hope you'll come back for the next one. 